On February 24, 1968, K-129, a Russian ballistic missile submarine, left the harbor at Petropavlovsk on Russia's Pacific coast. The sub had been sent on a routine patrol around the North Pacific. What the captain and crew didn't realize was that K-129 would never return to Petropavlovsk and was about to become the center of one of the most incredible covert operations in history. On March 8th, K-129 failed to make its scheduled radio check-in. After two days with no contact, the Soviet Navy began a massive search for the missing sub. More than 30 ships and 40 aircraft scoured an area the size of Greenland for two months with no luck. By mid-May, the search had ended. As far as the Soviet Navy was concerned, K-129 and the 98 men on board were lost forever. As the Soviet search efforts wound down, the United States Navy moved in. They realized what the loss of K-129 meant. Somewhere at the bottom of the Pacific was an unguarded Russian submarine. If they could find it, and if it was still intact, and if they could recover it, it would give them access to a treasure trove of Soviet technology, including its complement of five nuclear warheads. It would be one of the most valuable assets ever recovered, and could give the U.S. a critical edge in their decades-long standoff with the USSR. But first, they had to do what the Russians had failed to, and find the wreck somewhere at the bottom of the Pacific. On March 11th, a network of underwater microphones that the Navy had placed around the Pacific had detected a pressure wave that might have been caused by an explosion on K-129. The source of the event was triangulated to an area northwest of Hawaii, and on July 15th, the submarine USS Halibut was deployed from Pearl Harbor to investigate. The Halibut crisscrossed the search area, using sonar, strobe lights, and cameras to scour the ocean floor. After another two months of searching, they found it, the wreck of K-129, lying nearly 5,000 meters below the surface. When the information reached Washington, the go-ahead was given to attempt to recover the wreck, with one change. Instead of the Navy, the mission was assigned to the Special Projects Office of the CIA, and Project Azorian was born. The Special Projects Office was responsible for some of the greatest innovations of the Cold War, including Corona, the first successful spy satellite, and the U-2 and SR-71 Blackbird spy planes. But Project Azorian was going to be their biggest challenge yet, K-129 was as long as a football field and weighed almost 3,000 tons. Nothing that big had ever been recovered from so deep. Eventually, the CIA settled on a plan. They would build a salvage ship, the most advanced ever designed, and use it to lift the wreck from the ocean floor in complete secrecy. Global Marine, a maritime design firm based in Los Angeles, and an industry leader in deep sea drilling was contracted to design the ship. But there was a problem. There were only a few shipyards in the country that could build a ship like that, weighing 50,000 tons and measuring nearly 600 feet long. There was no way that the CIA could keep a ship like that secret. They needed a cover story. Enter Howard Hughes, the billionaire film producer, inventor, and industrialist. The CIA approached Hughes with an idea. Hughes would announce to the world that he was funding the construction of an advanced mining ship to test the viability of mining the sea floor for minerals. It was the perfect cover. The idea of deep sea mining was a perfect fit for an eccentric innovator like Hughes, and his companies weren't publicly traded, so there were no shareholders to ask questions about unusual spending. Hughes agreed to the plan, and construction on the ship was started in 1971 outside Philadelphia. A year later, on November 4, 1972, the Hughes Glomar Explorer was launched. The Explorer was an engineering marvel. While a series of powerful thrusters kept the ship stable, Sections of steel pipe were hoisted up the derrick in the middle of the ship, 60 feet at a time. The sections were fitted together before being lowered through the bottom of the hull. At the end of the pipe was the capture vehicle, which worked like a giant claw. After being lowered to the ocean floor, the capture vehicle would grab the wreck and then lift it through two sliding doors in the explorer's hold, where it would be stored during its return journey to the States. The whole operation would occur out of sight, hidden from other boats and spy planes. On June 20, 1974, the Glomar Explorer left California and reached the wreck site two weeks later. The capture vehicle was lowered to the ocean floor, where it grabbed the wreck of the sub and began to lift it to the surface. However, after several hours of lifting, disaster struck. The steel that had been used to make the capture vehicle was strong but brittle, and under the immense strain of the wreck, several of the capture vehicle's claws had snapped and most of the wreck dropped back to the ocean floor. The crew continued to lift what remained. Exactly what the Explorer recovered remains classified to this day, 
but it's believed that the bow of the sub with two nuclear torpedoes and various documents were successfully recovered. The explorer also recovered the bodies of six members of K-129's crew. A military funeral for the crew was held on the deck of the explorer before the bodies were buried at sea. After returning to port, the CIA began planning a second mission to recover the lost section of the sub, but by this point, information about the project was starting to leak. A second attempt was ruled too risky, and Project Azorian came to an end. The story of the operation was broken in 1975 by journalist Jack Anderson. When asked for a comment, the CIA stated they could neither confirm nor deny the existence of the project. This non-answer became known as the Glomar response. Project Azorian was always controversial, even within the government. The CIA still considers it one of their greatest technical achievements, but the costs were staggeringly high. The project took nearly six years and cost the equivalent of $8 billion today, and was only a partial success at best. Any intelligence that the operation gathered was six years out of date, and it's never been proven that the operation produced any valuable intelligence. After the end of Project Azorian, the Glomar Explorer was refitted to work as a legitimate drilling ship, and was leased out to work in the private sector for the next 30 years. In 2015, TransOcean, the Explorer's current owner, announced the ship would be scrapped by the end of the year, marking the end of one of the most bizarre and complicated operations of the Cold War. The story of Project Azorian is so much crazier than I could possibly fit into a 7 minute video. For the whole story, I highly recommend The Taking of K129 by Josh Dean. And if you want to see more videos like this, click here to subscribe.